All right. Uh, now, Father, we ask your blessing upon the teaching this morning. May the Holy Spirit be our guide and instructor. We look to lead us in all truth in the Scripture. Make these things plain. Give us understanding, clarity, and wisdom where we lack it. May we not be guilty of teaching something that isn't so or an error. May you guide and protect us, Mary, in our teaching. And may these uh, scriptures we're about to look at and study this morning, may they uh, impress upon our mind the imminent of your coming, the imminence, and, the, and, the, and how it is at hand and at the door. And may the Christians that have gathered here this morning not waste any more time, if they've been wasting it, uh, waiting for thee to come, but get busy and, and be occupied when you return. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. On our subject this morning, UFO, which we talked about a little bit the last time, and I will go a little bit uh, further in it. If you've got a Bible, turn to Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is the classic, is the classic UFO. Ezekiel chapter 1. <clears throat> now, there, there are four UFOs in the Bible. Uh, two of them are in one chapter in Zechariah. In Zechariah, you're told in Zechariah there's a flying scroll. And a scroll is a book form like that, like a window shade that rolls up. And that flying scroll or roll goes over the earth. And it goes in the house, it rocks the house. You say, what is that? That's an unidentified flying object. <laughs> See, all unidentified flying objects aren't UFOs. But when you think of a saucer, when you're a UFO, you think of a flying saucer, but they're not all saucers. That one's a scroll. There's another one in, uh, in Zechariah, and that's an ephah, a basket like this. And a woman sits in it, like that. And then, pretty soon the woman is knocked down into the ephah. She smashed down the lead covers put on top of the ephah like this. And then two women come out with, a, with the wings of a stork. And these two stork-winged women fly off with this ephah. And they take this ephah and put it in the land of Babylon. And these two stork-winged women are, uh, are the pictures you use for angels. So when you buy a picture of an angel at the dime store, you always have a woman with the stork wings. Long hair and stork wings. Those aren't angels. No angel in the Bible has wings, and all of them are male. So what you got when you have a picture of an angel that you buy at the dime store, that's a picture of a flying female demon. That's what you got. And in Zechariah, says they'll take that thing and establish it on its own base in the land of Shinar. Shinar is in Babylon. That's where the Tower of Babel was built. That's Genesis chapter 11. When they journeyed from the east, they came to a plain in the land of Shinar, and they built that place, and the name of that place is Babel, because there the Lord confounded all the language of the earth. Now there's three UFOs right there. Here's the fourth one. Ezekiel chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 4. I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof of the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. So you got a whirlwind, the cyclone, like that. And so you notice last night when I drew Satan, I drew him body like a serpent coming down like a cherub, which you're going to look at. And I drew him so he came out like this, like a snake's body. And then I put a black cloud around the bottom of the body, and then and the black cloud go up like a tornado. Now, there's something about that thing that has to do with the second coming of Christ. When the Lord appears to Job, he appears out of a whirlwind at the end of the book of Job. When the Lord shows up in the river Kibar after lamentation, God's all through with the Jew, he shows up with a whirlwind. Now, what one is also mentioned in Isaiah and Jeremiah, second advent. Now, that thing right there is, a, is what you call a cyclone or a tornado. And that thing, that thing is not like a hurricane. You can run from a hurricane, but you can't run from a tornado because you don't know what it's going to touch. Hurricane, you know, it's coming in, you move off away from it, you know, 50, 100 miles. Of course, it can change direction, but, uh, but you can, even then, you can run north, south, east, or west. But a tornado, you don't know what it's going to do. I had a friend in Kansas City when a tornado came through there, this was about 15 years ago, and he tried to run from it, ran out of the house, jumped in his car, and before he got into second gear, he looked out the window in there and said he was going by the city water tank. It was 150 feet in the air. He saw Kansas City, Missouri, <laughs> outside the thing, you know. And that thing put him on down the valley about a mile and a half, and, and he got 
kind of banged up and not too bad. He's in the hospital about three months. But you think that fellow tried to run that thing? His neighbor laughed at him and said, you can't run that thing, man. You better get in the basement. <laughs> and uh, that, ta- that tornado there that goes like that, that's a picture of the uh, picture of the rapture. When that thing comes down, there's a vacuum in the middle of that thing, and the stuff flies up there, and the stuff it does is fantastic. For example, I preach around Oklahoma and Kansas City. There are tornado alleys in America. One of them is West Oklahoma, and one of them is West Texas. One of them is down the, by the Caw and the Missouri River near Kansas City, and one is in North Alabama, and one runs right down around Exene, Ohio, and Dayton, Ohio. I don't know why that is, but they, they show up there all the time. And uh, I've talked with people there who said when the tornado came through, it took the refrigerator and the range out of the kitchen and took them through the house and blew them out the front bay window. And here's the bay window blown out and a canary cage hanging in the window with a canary still in it. Wild stuff, man. One guy told me he went through my house and took all the books out of the shelf and the rugs off the floor and left everything else in there. When a tornado comes, what you have to do is open your windows. Because if you keep them closed, it, it creates that suction vacuum out there and all the pressures in your house. You've got enough air pressure in your house to blow your house up. All you got to do is take off the air pressure outside and boom, up she goes. <laughs> but those tornadoes are selective. And uh, so when the Lord comes, up you go. You don't have to worry about the rest of them. I'm say they're not going. All right, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 5. There came out of the midst thereof the likeness of four living creatures. They had the likeness of a man. They got a man's body on them. And everyone had four faces and everyone had four wings. Wild. Wild. A man with four faces and four wings. And their feet were straight feet. It wasn't a man's foot. The sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, split hoof. And they sparkle like the color of burnished brass. Those are wild looking things. That thing is, that thing is half bird. It's got these wings on it. But the body here is like a man. But when you get down to the guy's feet, they're not a man's feet. They're the calf's foot. Like that. Now you gotta admit, that's a wild looking thing. That thing is a combination of bird and beast and man. It's a mutant. All right, verse 8. They had the hands of a man under their wings. On their four sides, they had their four faces and their wings. Wings joined together. Then they had the faces. The faces are like, he says, a lion. There's the king of the wild beasts. An eagle. There's the king of the flying beasts. A man, they're the king of the creation, and an ox, they're the king of the domestic beast, beasts. So these animals that God made that are these weird supernatural creatures represent the creation. The only trouble is there's one missing. And there's no representative of the amphibian class, or what you call the reptile class, or the fish class. If you want to get a king of that, it'd be a whale, which in Leviticus, which in uh, Psalm is called Leviathan. All right, so you got now. You still with me? We're just, you know, we're just, you know, kind of getting up speed. We haven't started down the strip yet. All right. So here's this. Here's four of these things, whatever they are. You said it's wild rock. I know it is. You said I don't understand. I don't understand it either. But there it is. Did he ever lie? Then he's not lying there. It's the wildest thing I've ever heard in my life. It is. Matter of fact, so wild, folks don't even believe it. But there it is. That's the same book that says, For God so loved the world. Same book. Same book. All right. Then when Ezekiel sees this thing, he sees a platform. And here are these four, whatever they are, and they're called cherubims had these wings, and they're sailing along with this thing like this. And on this, on this platform is a throne. And a man, called like the Son of Man, is sitting on the throne like that. But that ain't the worst of it. 
Verse 15, Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces, and the appearance of the wheels, and there were wheels here, each one of them, a wheel here, and a wheel there, and a wheel here, and a wheel there. The color of a barrel. Uh, verse uh, 16, And their work was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Then it's either like that, with the other wheel there, like that, or it's a wheel like this, with the other wheel like that, like a gyroscope. And it said, verse 15, they turned not when they went. Must be a gyroscope. Now here's, well that ain't the worst of it. Here's the worst of it. 20, whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Whither their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them. Now watch this. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Life in an inorganic wheel? Must have made a mistake. No, he says it verse 21. He says it twice, so you'll get it. When those went, these went. When those stood, these stood. When those went up in the earth, the wheel went over them. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Now, isn't that so? How in the world could you have the living spirit in a wheel of a thing? Isn't that strange? All right, turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel 28. We're going to get an alchemy and black magic and everything else here before we get through. Ezekiel 28. There's more in this book than you'd care to find out. <laughs> One time a little boy, a teacher, told him to give a report in a book about polar bears. He had to write a five-page uh, analysis of the book on polar bears. About in the fifth grade, you know, when he, his analysis said, Dear teacher, this book tells me more about polar bears than I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Ezekiel 28. Uh, now this is a reference to the devil. Look at verse 15. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Look at verse 14. Thou art anointed cherub. These are cherub. Or in the plural, cherubim. And the devil was a cherub. You keep reading these books, the devil was an angel. He was not an angel. He was a cherub. So what's the difference? Cherubim have wings. Angels don't. That we know to get messed up, they read over there in Revelation chapter 12 or 11 uh, or chapter 12, and the devil and his angels were cast out. And once they read the devil and his angels, they thought he must be an angel. But don't say that. It says he's transformed into an angel of light, but he's not an angel of light. He's a cherubim, has wings. And if he's, if he was changed anything, he was converted from a cherubim, Ezekiel 28, to a dragon. Now, when I drew that picture last night, I didn't, probably you didn't stop thinking about why I drew it the way I did, but what I drew you was a cherubim. And I put wings on him. And I put horns on him. Like he was related to an ox. I'll show you why I did that. Ezekiel chapter 10. Ezekiel chapter 10. You know what the devil's called in, in legend? He's called Old Splitfoot. How many ever heard that? Let me see your hands. You just read in Ezekiel chapter 1, they had a split foot like a calf. Like that. So I didn't draw you the bottom of that thing. I drew you a serpent's body coming out like this. I didn't draw the bottom of that thing. Because it's, it's just too wild. <laughs> You wind up with a thing like this, that's like an ox, and it has wings like this. And if you put him on a pole like this, he's an H and E W and medical core, you know, insignia in the medical core. But the thing comes down like this, and then the bottom ends in what? A split foot? Or what? Two split feet? On oh, Ezekiel chapter. 28. Now, <clears throat> you say, this is getting way over my head. It's always been over my head. But man shall not live by bread alone, but by what, folks? What? Say it again. Okay, then the fundamentals won't do. 
You don't live by the fundamentals. You live by every word. And they're the words. See the difference? Folks say the fundamentals, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fundamentalist and then I believe in the fundamentals of the faith, but that isn't all I believe. I believe the book. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say to him, why do you say king of Tyrus? Because he's addressing the devil in the king. You swear to get that from Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, Peter says, far be it to me, Lord. And Jesus turned to Peter and says, what? Get thee behind me who? Satan. You see the thing? Ezekiel chapter 16, he's addressing the devil in Simon Peter. So there he's addressing the devil and the king of Tyrus. See? It's real plain, if you've got an archaic Elizabethan 1611 King James Bible that's 300 years out of date. If you got your new Bible, you'll know where you're at, that daddy. You don't know where you're at, daddy. Oh, <laughs> Ezekiel 28, verse 12. Thou sealest up the psalm full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. It's the devil. Thou hast been in Eden, while the king of Tyrus never was in Eden. But Satan was. Now watch it carefully. Every precious stone was thy covering. Well, has he got stone part of his body or just his clothes? We'll say clothes. The sardius, topaz, diamond, bear longs, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and gold. And gold. And gold. You won't notice that. Job says, when I'm tried, I'll come forth as gold. Well, that just his clothes? Or is that him he's talking about? I know of a high priest back in the Old Testament, and you know what he had to put on his chest? A breastplate. You know, isn't that breastplate? Them bare stones. So every year around the 25th of December, you see this beautiful tree up here, and it's got these beautiful lights all over it. And sometimes they blink. <laughs> and that old priest back in the Old Testament had a plate right here purple, blue, green, orange, yellow, red stones in it, preach on the twelve tribes of Israel. And then behind that bag, you have what they call the Urim and Thummim. And the Urim and Thummim means lights, lights, and perfection. And when David wanted to find out about something, he'd say, bring hither the ephod. And Abiah thought, bring hither the ephod, which was the, the, the priest's clothing with the breastplate tied to it. And David would say, Lord, tell me something. Is Saul going to come down to get me? And the Lord said, going to come down and get you. Set it through the breastplate. And he said, if he comes down with the Ziphites delivering him up into his hand, and the breastplate says, beep, 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 boop, bom, beep, 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 bom. video, Nintendo, pop, beep, boom, bom, bom. they will deliver the up. <laughs> <laughs> so you have some kind of a revelation that comes through lights, and they come through precious stones. And the first time they mention they're connected with the devil. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? You know, what the new, you know what the new Bibles call the devil? They call him Jesus Christ. Ripplinger, Ripplinger, I'm, she goes to Carl Ackes Church up in White Plains. I saw her last week. And she was, she was just an unassuming, just quiet, kind of a, just kind of a naive kind of a woman. I mean, you would, she just didn't act like a brilliant intellect at all, you know. I mean, she's pretty really naive, you know. I talked to her, I said, I told you to stay off that radio program, that TV program of those fellows. I said, they're not going to face the issue. They're going to duck and dodge and make you look like a fool. And she looked at me, she said, Brother Ruckman, those men are wicked. <laughs> <laughs> I smothered an hysterical laugh and said, yeah, they sure are. <laughs> I mean, no. Uh, that book she wrote just put, it cut their sales in half. And they've been howling about it ever since. But she said they're wicked. Yes, they are. She called them a New Age version. The front of her New Age version, she got a picture there of a nice little old flying serpent up there. And you know why that is? Because the NAV and the New ASV and the NIV and the Hagar, Crock, and the Wizard of Id and all that stuff, they say in Isaiah chapter 14 that Satan is the morning star. And that's the title Jesus Christ gave to himself in Revelation 22. 
And some of you fellow folks in this morning, you've got friends and relatives, don't you, that believe that crap and put up with it and tolerate it and got in their home and someone read it and someone promote it. And it's a grief to you, but you can't explain nothing to them because they're stupid. They're stupid. <laughs> and some of them been to college and they're more stupid than they were when they went. <laughs> All right, Ezekiel chapter 20. Amen, brother. Ezekiel 28, 13. The workmanship of thy tablets. Well, that's a musical instrument. And of thy pipes. Those are musical instruments. Were prepared in thee in the day thou was created. What is that? The tablets, the string, and the instrument, and the pipe, is the wind instrument. And every instrument in the band is a stringed instrument or a wind instrument. If it puts out any kind of sound, musical sound, not percussion. Percussion doesn't put out a musical sound. Percussion, the cymbals and drums, put out a wavelength like that. But a musical sound puts out a steady wavelength. Everything in this room is strings or pipes. That's the pipes and that's the strings. You swords in that thing, a harps in that thing. Well, all you got is two of them. He says in Joe a Jubal back there in Genesis chapter four, he was the father of them and handled the pipe, the harp, and the organ. That was it. The harp and the organ. There's the harp, there's the organ. You saw that thing right over there? That's sometimes called a cello. Viola. Violin, mandolin, guitar, banjo, the stringed instruments. They're all strings. That over there is sometimes called a tuba, a French horn, a baritone, a saxophone, a clarinet, a flute, a fife. It's pipes. It's pipes. It's pipes. It's got pipes in it. Organ has those pipes and blows the sound through those pipes. Wind going through the pipe. The basic two instruments are a flute and a harp. That's them. And he says, Tabs and pipes was prepared in me the day thou was created. And you know what that looks like? It looks like that in uh, the body of something supernatural, the Lord, not us, the Lord has combined organic with inorganic so he can put organic life in inorganic life. Now I'll show you two more that show that out real clear. Come to Luke and get Luke chapter Luke chapter twenty three. Lord and the way to the cross. Uh, Luke chapter. Uh, let me uh, no Luke chapter twenty. Make it Luke chapter twenty two. Uh, no, no, you won't get. Ain't gonna do either. Coming earlier. Make it Luke chapter. 20. No, you have to get back from that. <laughs> Luke chapter 9. Here, Luke chapter 19. I got it. Luke 19. I get Luke 19 in one hand, and then get Deuteronomy chapter 32 in the other. Now, see what I'm doing? I'm already messing you up. <laughs> I'm, I'm running you to Revelation, to Ezekiel, to Luke. To Deuteronomy, before I get through, I'm going to go Genesis and Isaiah. What am I doing? I'm going through 66 books that were written 2,000 years apart on three continents by 42 writers. They, there couldn't be any collusion. When I put this stuff together to show you what's going on, how can you say that a man wrote it? He couldn't have written it. Because the guys who wrote it, they don't know what they're putting together. I'm at the faculty at Bob Jones and Tennessee Temple and BBC and Pensacola Christian College and Wheaton and Fuller and Moody and, uh, and Dallas and Liberty Baptist College. If they don't know in 1996, you think they could have known then? See, this book here, we call this book the Holy Bible, you see? And the proof of that book being holy is not that it tells you how to get saved. And the proof of that book being holy is not that it tells you how to live a good life. That ain't got nothing to do with it. The proof that book's holy is it puts together the phenomena that you can't produce with a computer. 
Whoever's writing that book is sitting way up beyond 1996 and writing the book backwards. Whoever's writing that book is saying, Ezekiel, put this down. Moses, put that down. John, put that down. Paul, and when the guy puts it down, he can't understand what he's doing. If you ever something about that stuff back in the Old Testament? Lord says the writer of Ruth, he said, right there that Ruth bring home an ephah of barley to her mother. Well, why put that in there? It's a dumb thing to put in a book on religion. <laughs> you ever get to Genesis? Don't eat. And if you eat, you're going to die, and you shall eat, but you can eat this, but you can't eat that. And the woman ate, and he said, have you eaten? She said, I ate. My husband said, he gave me, she gave me to eat, and the serpent made me eat, and you ate. And they, what is that doing in the book of religion? That's all about your belly. Eat, eat, eat. Who ever heard of a book of religion starting that way? Don't eat this, eat that, don't eat this, you eat that, you're going to mess up. We can eat this, but we can't eat that. And she ate, and he ate, and he... What a thing, man. Now see, whoever's writing that book knows, he knows, that's where the trouble begins, and that's how it began. He knows how it's going to end, and he wrote the whole thing and dumped it right in your lap. Do you ever think about this? The Lord, and I, I don't mean to be blasphemous or, or ir irreligious, you know, profane, although I sound that way many times. <laughs> but, uh, but, but the Lord is a character. Honest to God, he's a character. And I'm not going to say he takes a sadistic pleasure in watching you suffer. But it must be some pleasure to him. <laughs> because he, he knows you're already up there with him. You see, he's out ahead. I'm, we're stuck here. It ain't no joke here. <laughs> but, but he's out there with him. It's a joke because he's out there and he knows how you're going to be shouting and yelling and screaming and hollering and enjoying yourself. And with him, it's already done. Sure, man. He, some of you folks blink at me. Don't you understand what I'm saying? Who, whoever wrote this book is out in eternity and looking backwards. Well, you know that's true when you read the book of Revelation. How does it end? It ends with you up there. And everything's fine. So as far as God is concerned, you ain't got a problem. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. It always to be kind of sadistic, you know. Like, you know, you're, you're toying with him, you know. You don't make much to him. You're sealed with him in heavenly places. You got it made. He knows you got it made. And where he's looking at you, you and him are in fellowship just having a ball up there. Yeah, that's it. All right, Luke chapter 19, verse 39. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said to him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, look out, the stones should immediately cry out. Now is he, is he just saying that figurative? All right, before you go back there to Deuteronomy, let's take Luke. And let's hit, uh, hit uh, Luke chapter, no, Luke chapter 3. And Luke chapter 3, verse 8. Luke 3, verse 8. Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourself, You have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones, inorganic, to raise up children, organic, to Abraham. See that thing? Now, if I've ever heard something so ridiculous, sure you did, you learn it in school. Every school you went to, the public school taught you that man came from rocks. Every one of them. <laughs> well, you went to school, what they tell you? They said the earth was slung out of the sun at 6,000 degrees and cooled down to molten lava, and it was rocks. And then you showed up after a couple of million years. Where'd you come from? Rocks. You got rocks for brains. You're stone, man. <laughs> I mean, when you go out there in the driveway, be careful who you step on. <laughs> <laughs> They're rocks, not asphalt. We used to sing, we used to sing back in, in grade school when I was a boy, Oh, be kind to your web-footed friends, for a duck may be somebody's uncle. Be kind to your friends in the swamp. Da -da 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 you know. Why, Darwin said, you came from rocks. And you think this is strange? Deuteronomy chapter 32. 
Deuteronomy chapter two, uh, 32, verse, uh, verse 15. And then we'll begin to make some application. Deuteronomy 32, 15. But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxing fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Verse 18, of the rock that begat thee. There's a rock that gives birth to people. Of the rock that begat thee. Verse 31, their rock, an ordinary rock, is not as our rock. A supernatural rock. Paul says that rock was Christ. One more. Joshua 24. Joshua 24. The walls have ears. They're just beginning to bug them. You know what they can do right now? The FBI went want to close down this church and sue Mother Noah in a torch suit for upsetting folks. They can take a dart and shoot at that wall there from the outside and it'll photograph everything in this building and pick up all the sound and record it five miles away. That's how far this country has gone in just being a police fascist state of unsaved, demon-possessed nuts. And before they burned Corrish and those 83 people out there and murdered them, they shot that thing in there and then they I've seen photographs of the little children inside the place showing through the wall before they burned them to death. They squirted military tear gas in there, which is inflammable, and before they did that, they cut off their electricity for two weeks, so they'd have to use kerosene lanterns and Coleman lanterns. And they waited a good windy day and burned the whole bunch to death. That investigation of Washington, that was just too funny for words. Just too funny for words. The FBI destroyed all the evidence before the investigation took place. They bulldozed it under, no autopsies, no corpses, no nothing. That's how far it's gone. But the rocks have ears. Joshua 24. Joshua 24, verse 26. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up there on an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. Ain't that something? So right now they're messing around out around Groom Lake in Area 51. They're messing around out there trying to uh, pick up sound waves recorded in rocks. They've already got now machines where they can call back if you stand by a rock and say something. They can pick it up four days after you say it. Get it back in the rock. Right now I'm being taped, I guess. But all that taping equipment is made out of crushed rock. And if you get those uh, Nintendo machines, then computers can run right down there and get down the little old stuff that well, you'll find a little old piece of gold in there. This stuff is gold. A little gold white, a little gold chip here, a little gold piece there, a little gold piece there. Something about them rocks. All right, now. You say, what does this got with UFOs? I'll show you. Here's a movie called, uh, it's called uh, Star Wars. And here comes a fellow walking along like this, you know. Just a regular, ordinary fellow, you know, Luke Skywalker, you know, or Indiana Jones, you know, or Connecticut Smith, or, you know, you know or uh, Idaho Billy. <laughs> and he's going on like this, and then right behind him is coming a, an animal who acts like a man, walks like a man, talks like a man. You know, tobacco chewy or whatever his name is. And this animal's coming along behind this man like this, and then right behind him, here comes a nice gold. Robot. And it walks like a person, you know, acts like a person, but it's inorganic. But it's gold. And it goes along like this, and then right behind that comes a sure enough fire plug. There's a slot machine coming along right behind him like this, a little fire plug going boom, like this, and it's organic. Now, you know what that stuff is? Somebody's trying to get a message across to you. And somebody is telling you if they can just mess with the genetic code enough and manipulate this DNA and RNA and this ribosomes and chains of nuclear acids called uh, viable proteins and get all this stuff laid together, they can take inorganic stuff like a rock and mineral and turn it into vegetables 
And these vegetables can be turned into animals. These animals can be turned into men because they're all related down the line. In other words, eventually you'll be able to get uh, an exterminator or terminator that looks like a man. When you blow him all the bits with your ray gun, he's a mechanical machine inside. And if all this stuff is together, then the liquid is involved. So the, the monster might be able to assume a liquid shape and blend in with something and then pull back himself in liquid shape and put himself together again. Now you know what that means? That means all you suckers that are watching that TV day and night and night and day and reading them comic books night and day and day and night have got your foot right in the place where Satan's working. And what Satan is doing is conditioning you and preparing you for what's going to take place. Now, this morning UFOs, we're not going to say uh, it's going to take place. I'm getting ready to say it's already taken place. Without your knowledge. And this stuff we're talking about is here. But it's underground. As Horace really said, go west, young man. So if you Pick up your newspaper, The Troubles in Oklahoma City. It's in Texas. It's in Boise, Idaho. And the next time, Montana and Wyoming and New Mexico and Arizona. That's the next time you hit it, you go down there and you buy a little magazine at the newsstand called Newsweek or Time Magazine. And here's a rancher standing here like this with a bunch of people behind him. And it says, don't tread on me. And Time and Newsweek are telling you that folks out west, the ranchers, are ready to rebel. It's on, I saw it on the magazine right coming out of the airport. What is that? The government has got to wipe out the independent farmers and ranchers in the west to do what they're trying to do. They've got to get rid of them. They've got to get the land. They say they're rebelling. Rebelling against what? Rebellion. Against what? What could it be they're rebelling against? I'll tell you what it is. Armed troops that are going to come in and kill them. That's what they're rebelling against. All that stuff you read, you see, you never get the truth. The whole truth. Nothing but the can. Now this organic and inorganic stuff, let's take it one step deeper. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. And begin at the beginning. And let's get Genesis 2 in one hand, and let's get Revelation 21 in the other. And then we've really got, uh, we got both ends wrapped up. Revelation 21 and Genesis 2. All right. In the Dark Ages, they used to have what they call alchemists. And an alchemist, uh, now your word for it is chemistry. An alchemist. And you see the word chemistry there. Sitting right there. An alchemist was a fellow who was always trying to make gold out of base metals. Copper and silver and mercury and those. He was trying to make gold out of it. And all those alchemists believe what they call the philosopher's stone. And the philosopher's stone was supposed to be some peculiar rock or stone that could convert stuff from base metal into gold. And that thing is a standard thing in the history of philosophy and church history and the Dark Ages and all those philosophers through that stuff. What about the philosopher's stone? Matter of fact, uh, one of the great false gods that people began to worship even at the time of Christ was called Mithras. And Mithras is, uh, a statue of Mithras shows a stone like this and then Mithras coming out of the stone like this, kind of like King Arthur's sword, you know, in the rock, stuck in the rock, and he's being born out of the rock. The rock is begatting the man, like you read in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, verse 10. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, the sending out of God from heaven. All right, uh, silver, light, so forth and so on. 
Then you get to verse uh, 18. And the building of the wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like unto clear glass. Is that statement? Pure gold, clear glass. The whole city is gold. But when I get to heaven, going to walk all over God's heaven, heaven, put on my golden slippers. When I walk them golden stairs, I'm walk lower God's heaven, heaven, heaven. All right, this is a golden, this is a golden city here. But this golden city can give birth to people. Turn to Galatians. The organic is connected to the inorganic. Galatians. Chapter 4. How many of you are still with me? Let me see your hands. Okay, well, we'll get a little deeper here in a minute. <laughs> right, Galatians chapter 4. Verse 26. Scripture with Scripture. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. It's a city giving birth to children. That's a strange thing, isn't it? I go back to Revelation chapter uh, 21 again, and we'll find something we missed. Revelation chapter 21, verse 9. Do you ever wonder why you're called living stones? Lively stones, First Peter. Lively stones, Ephesians chapter 2. Built up in a spiritual house. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So is that just a similitude? No, it ain't going to work. Look at verse 9. 21, 9. There came out to me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials for the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. The bride of Christ is not a bunch of people. It's a city, verse 10. Now, you know it's a city, but you also know it's a body. The body of Christ, Ephesians chapter 5. Your bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. The body of Christ made up of people. Amen? Come on, folks. By one spirit are you baptized in one body. But it's a city. But that's where you're going to live. It's a living city. So it has living stone. But they gold. They gold. Now, you know what that looks like? I'll be lying this wild, way out in left field. This Bible's always been way out in left field. <laughs> and right field, and in the middle and place else. That thing is saying that it's saying, it's, it's in, intimating this, that when every time you lead a soul to Christ, that soul becomes part of Christ's body and becomes a living stone. The rock begat it, and the rock gave birth to him. And becomes a living stone that goes into a city and becomes part of the city, and the city grows. And as the converts get saved, the city grows out of gold. It's a living city, but it's metal. It's gold. Genesis chapter two. Genesis chapter. Now, don't preach this your first day in the pulpit when you're. <laughs> Trying out for the a minister and as a pulpit supply. For goodness sake, don't bring this stuff up. Galatians chapter 2. They'll think you're a heretic taking one of Ruckman's peculiar teachings. Uh, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse uh, 9. Now you see what they call peculiar teachings are the book. You know what's peculiar? This book is peculiar. And if you believe it, you're going to be a peculiar people. Uh, James White, you know, a silly ass, wrote this book called The King James Onlyism Controversy. He challenged me to a debate. You know, he first he wanted to try to get me the Ankerberg show with him and some of his buddies. And John Ankerberg wrote me a letter and said, uh, 
this uh, we want to have you come up here in our video show for eight hours and meet these fellows and debate the King James issue. He said, this will be your key moment. <laughs> you know, the key moment. And I wrote him back and I said, my key moment was when I got saved. Don't give me this key moment stuff, okay, buddy. And I said, now I'm, gonna, I'm not going to come up there and play tiddlywinks with the Athenians. That's Acts chapter 17. The Athenians wanted to hear tell something new. I said, I'm not going to play till we but tell I'll do. I said, if you'll have these fellows meet and make out a list of errors in the King James Bible and send them to me, we'll come up and discuss those errors. I'll come. He never wrote back. They can't face the music. They can't face the music. If you find anybody, anytime, anywhere that says, I want to debate with Ruckman, I want to debate with Ruckman, say, okay, all you have to do is send Ruckman a list of the errors that you're going to debate. And then we'll shovel the snow. And they won't do it. They won't do it. They won't do it. Somebody suggested that at Bob Jones one time. And Bob Jones Jr. told the fellow, said, oh, no, we couldn't do that. And the fellow said, well, Ruckman said he'd take on the whole faculty. He said, why don't you have him come up here and put two hours in chapel and bring out your whole faculty and take him on. He said, oh, no, we couldn't do that. He said, why not? He said, well, he's too smart. <laughs> Isn't that a strange alibi? You know something? If I thought you were smart and I knew more about the Bible than, than, than I knew, I'd pay you to come down and teach me. Amen. Wouldn't any honest man? Strange thing. Bill Bartlett's boy told me last night, he said, well, Bob Jones, you know what they said? I said, what he said? The, I was called him one time. They said, you're not allowed to read Ruckman's books. Nobody here is allowed to read Ruckman's books. And Barnett said, why not? He said, they're too readable. <laughs> what a strange thing. You know what that fellow was saying? He was saying, Ruckman writes stuff you can understand. That's why you shouldn't read him. Strange mentality, you know. Now, you take this thing here, write this thing. Here. I'm going to get ready to show you. I'll grant this peculiar teaching, but what do I care? If it's in the book, it's in the book. You know, most of these scholars do, say 98% of them. When they find a verse in the Bible they don't understand, the first thing you do is get a Greek lexicon or a Hebrew lexicon and try to change the verse so it'll, they can understand it. And what they do is take their system they set up and made the whole Bible bow to their system. And if a book doesn't fit their system, like say, for example, James, Hebrews, or Matthew, they will take the verse and twist the verse around so it'll meet the demand of their system. For example, eternal security. I thought eternal security reads in Hebrews chapter 3, we're made partakers of Christ if we hold firm the confidence of the hope steadfast to the end. That isn't true. It's in the book of Hebrews. It isn't true of me. I'm not made a partaker of Christ if I hold to the end. I am part of his bone and his flesh right now. Yeah. Ephesians 5. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. I'm not waiting to partake of Jesus Christ, but somebody is. So now you take a Baptist scholar, pick that up. Hmm. It doesn't teach eternal security. King James Arminian. He put this thing here to make you think you could lose it. I'll go to the Greek. And he goes to the Greek and it says, this word here doesn't actually mean partake. <laughs> I mean, it's some unfortunate translation of the King James. A better rendering would be, and the dirty, lying, defrauding, two-faced crook perverts the word of God to bring you down to his level of stupidity. Now, that's what goes on. And that just, just burns me up. And don't get me on I'll get foam in the mouth and frothing, man. I mean, the old familiar words come to one's mind when I get talking along in here. Because I know what those guys are doing. They're putting young men out of the ministry and they're taking the authority from them and investing the authority in the school. I know what they're doing. I know what they're doing. I, 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 I don't want to deal with those fellows at a table. I want to get those fellows in the pool and play blood ball with them is what I want to do. <laughs> and those jokers by the neck going to where they believe me, I'll come up first. <laughs> I can still hold my breath a minute and 15 seconds. I bet they can. Never, never mind, get off that anyway. 
Because what they do is they make the Bible fit their system. Now, I believe in eternal security. Sure do. I think you're saved. You're saved for good. I think you're born again. You can't be unborn again. I believe once you get saved, you couldn't go to hell if you tried. But I don't recommend that you try it. <laughs> I got that much Methodist in me. <laughs> but I mean, I believe in eternal security. But when I find a verse there that doesn't teach it, what am I going to do with it? He says over there in Revelation, these are they that have the faith of Jesus Christ and keep the commandments of God. He says, if any man keep his commandments, he's got to write the tree of life. This couldn't be me. What do I need the tree of life for? I've got life. Amen. I don't get eternal life off a tree of life by picking fruit. I got eternal life by believing on the one that died on the tree. Amen. You see? So when you find a verse there that doesn't match your system, what are you going to do? you going to adjust your system to meet the demand of the verse, or are you going to change the verse to meet the demand of your system? You know what they do? They'll change the verse every time to make it meet the demands of their system. And that way, they preserve their own integrity at the expense of the Word of God. Do it every time. Now, that ain't my method. My manner of life from my youth up, my youth being 1949, has been when that verse just matched my system, I alter my system to match the verse. Once I do that, they say, heresy, 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 heresy. No, it's heresy because they don't know the book. They say, James White wrote one time, he said, Ruckman is brilliant in a strange kind of a way. <laughs> uh, you know why it's strange to him? Because he's a stranger to the book. That's the problem. Genesis 2, verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, and good for food, and the tree of also in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that has compassed the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. What did he say that for? Amen. Ain't that a strange thing stuck in there? The very first river. And the gold of that land is good. Why did he say that? That ain't got nothing to do with rivers and Eden and Adam and Eve. Never pops up again in chapter 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. What's the point sticking that in there? I bet when Moses wrote that thing, Moses said, what you want that in there for? Well, it says, shut up and write. <laughs> And he said, but what's that got to do with Adam? And the Lord said, that's my business. Write it down. He wrote it down. The goal of that land is good. Now, if you picked up a systematic theology written by anybody, Burkhoff, Dabney, Kuyper, Hahn, glory of God, he had a sheen, he had this glow around him. Then when he fell, he lost this glow or this divine Shekinah glory. But they won't tell you what it is. Let's turn to the Psalms. And let's go to Psalm 100 or something, brother. I don't have it marked in here. I think it's about 138. Yeah, it's 139. Psalm 139. This is a pro life anti abortion passage. But they never looked at it too close. Psalm 139. You know what Job said? For now hast tried me, I shall come forth as gold. <laughs> you know what one of the worst sins ever ever committed, you know what it was? They made him a golden calf. And worshipped it. And Moses came down the mount, he took that golden calf, and he melted that thing and pounded the thing in pieces and threw it on the water. And said, Get down there and drink it. You know, a fellow told me what gold in a solution looks like. He said it looks red, like blood. Go down and drink it. You know, worship that golden calf, then do what Adam and Eve did back in the garden. Put that stuff in your mouth you shouldn't have put in your mouth. Affect your blood. Turn your water into blood. Exodus. Slap over the river, water turns into blood. 
John chapter 2, slap on the water parts of stone and it turns into wine type of blood. Christ came by, not by water, but by water and blood. Cut out his side, out comes water. Oh, it's there, it's there, it is there, it is there. Psalm 139. Psalm 139 on your, how you were made. Verse 13, pro-life verse. Thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will pray thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, not my soul knoweth right well. My substance, that's what he's made out of, was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, not in my mother's womb. When I was curiously wrought in the lower parts of the earth. He couldn't be referring to himself, actually. David wasn't wrought in the uh, uh, lowest parts of the earth. I can tell you somebody who might have been. Adam. Dust thou art to dust thou shalt return. Did you ever hear of gold dust? Did you ever hear of gold dust? Dust thou art to dust thou shalt return. Made in the lower parts of the earth. That's Adam. Why did David say it? David was in Adam. You were an Adam before you were saved. Everyone, do you know that? Yes, sir. You put on the new man, you're in Christ. See that thing? Now, you know what all that implies? See, now, I'm, I'm not teaching this dogmatically. I'm not saying this is absolute. But you know what I put together here from what I got right here, if I believe it? You know what I got if I believe what I read and it was written right? <laughs> I've got a thing where no Adam is made, the material his body is made out of is not the material your body is made out of now. And when he fell, boy, he fell. He fell. And the liquid substance that made up that body was not like what makes my skin and bone and my flesh because I'm corruptible. Now, if you want the best metal you can get, the most incorruptible metal you can get, it's gold. And you take L out of gold and you got G-O-D. Is what you got. And all the tabernacle furniture was overlaid with gold. And the mercy seat and the cherubim weren't overlaid with gold. They were made out of solid gold. They weren't even overlaid. You know what I'm just saying? A fellow told me down there in Pensacola Naval Air Station, he said this cover over this X-15, one of these really supersonic jobs, that thing is gold. He said, that thing has something to do with the melting. I don't understand that stuff. Capacity or something of that thing. The thing is gold. Now, you know what this implies? This implies that the material that God used to put Adam together with is a material that no longer exists today. That's pretty obvious. I mean, p absolute pure gold, transparent like glass, like described in in Jerusalem is, if you made it out of regular metal, you'd still have just human metal. But in the Garden of Eden, you've got a supernatural situation. And you know that. You know that because he said, don't eat of that tree. And Eve comes over there and picks that fruit off that tree and pops that stuff in her mouth, and it affects her circulatory system. And she gives it to Adam, and he pops it in his mouth, and it affects his circulatory system. That, that can't be natural food. Now, of course, the health food stores will tell you it's almost true. You are what you eat. And what you put in your body gets into the bloodstream. See? But we're talking about a thing here where they got one kind of circulatory system. They pop something in the mouth and the whole system changes. And they're dead. They got the wrong liquid in them. You cut your finger, out she comes. Cut your nose, nose bleed, out she comes. Death. Your blood's no good. Life of the flesh and the blood. You got your blood from your daddy. You got it from his daddy. He got it from Adam. You die. Because what you got in you is no good. Now, before that happened, you put together with something different. You had a circulatory system that wasn't like that system. And if you wanted to put your finger on a substance you were made out of, like skin, and bones, that stuff right there, flesh and bones, it wouldn't have looked like that. 
because it made out of flexible, pliable, liquid gold. No, Adam lost it. Boy, he lost it. He lost the image and he came out looking like I look right now. Man, what a change. You know what's happened one of these days? Unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think according to his power which worketh in us. Not past, he's talking about the transformation of your body to be just like Christ in glory. That's what's involved. Now don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that Jesus Christ's resurrection body is made out of gold as you know it. But I'm telling you in the final transformation, that's what's coming. And what's coming is an organic metal. That's what's coming. Now let's get the loose ends. You ever hear a gold finger? Did you ever hear the king that everything he touched turned to gold? And the one day he touched his little girl. And she turned into gold. You know what they do out in California? Well, they do everything out in California. <laughs> the land, the fruits and nuts, affirmative action in the courtroom. But anyway, you know what they do out there? About uh, once every year, they get a little faceless image like this, and they call him an Oscar. You know what he's made out of? Pure gold. And you know what they give them to? They give them to stars. But in Revelation chapter 1, it says the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. And he says in Matthew, in the resurrection, they are as the angels of God. So out in that city, they call that city the angels. Los Angeles, the angels. Now what do you make of that? Isn't that a mess? <laughs> I mean, think of all that stuff. And the stuff is right there and the world has to follow it right to the T without knowing what the cotton picking thing is. Whoever's writing this book knows the past, the present, and the future, and how it's all going to come out and push down all the things you've got to go by, and you've got to go by them whether you believe it or not. It just comes through. Oh, now that's the introduction to the message this morning. That's, uh, now we're getting the main part of the message. <laughs> all right, here we go. Now, out west, and uh, of course, really said, go west, young man, go west. There's a Texas sitting here, and New Mexico sitting here, and Arizona sitting here like this. And then up here is Oklahoma like this, and Kansas, God help us, sitting here like this. And uh, Colorado sitting over here like this, and Utah, you know, sitting up here like this. And then uh, California going up like this. Now, the greatest center for UFO sightings is right here. That's New Mexico. I said, uh, yeah, Nevada off over here. Uh, that, that junction is Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona. Roswell, New Mexico is over in here. Area 51 at Groom Lake is over here. And then the Mormons is right there. And if you went out to this place where the UFO was spotted, I mean, the spotted maybe, you know, Oh, you know, oh, 10 a week for 40 years, something like that. And this, people either don't even report them anymore. If you got out right in here with this thing here, you'd find a highway that runs up Durango, up into Colorado like that. You'd never guess the number of that highway. It's 666. Go and get your road map and look it up. Think I'm pulling your leg? They said, Ruckman, you know, Ruckman, Ruckman. I get started about Ruckman, I could puke. <laughs> We're talking about the Bible. We're talking about facts. Go out there and drive it. Brother Donovan took our young people out there for a tour about a soul in the street preaching tour. Or something. Was it last summer, honey? 
so two summers ago, two summers ago, and they got right on this highway. They had more trouble on that highway than they had the whole trip. It's 666. Well, now recently they showed a TV strip on uh, autopsy of an alien. Roswell, New Mexico. Now that's, you're a little bit, you're 40 years behind the time of that. That happened years ago. That's, that's, that's old stuff. They're nothing about dead aliens. I'm talking about live aliens. Never mind them dead ones. That's kid stuff. That's, that stuff, Patterson Air Force Base, Dayton, that happened. Was it back in the 40s someplace somewhere? Back here? 50s? Was it 50s? 47? That's nearly 50 years ago. You call that news? <laughs> Imagine the fellow putting that on a news channel and calling it news. And a bunch of them Americans, oh, what's that? Oh, gee, what? Half a century. <laughs> 50 years, man. You talk about out of date. Well, and out here in this place out here, we got all kind of things going. And one thing we have is the government suddenly deciding that 2,000 acres of public land should be government land. And the first thing you know, the government has got them a piece here, and then a piece there, and then a piece here, and then a piece here, and then a piece here. And right now they're working in Wyoming and Montana. I mean, I've got home, I've got four books that thick called Matrixes. And they're 500 pages apiece. And those matrices show government things where the government comes in and takes 2,100 acres of land and the people who have land on it meet and object to it in public and they tell them you can still have your property but it's government property and you can't go through it. <laughs> and the people over the land say, what do you mean I can't go through it if it's still my land? And they say, well, certain portions are marked off with warnings, don't come here, this is federal property on the private land. So then what you get that is put up an EPA to take it. You're going to protect the white owl, or the red pussycat, or the gray wolf, or look out for the storing and the heron and the bat wing and the flap doodle out there, and that stuff is the alibi to get the land. That's where your national parks are out there. The trick is to get the whole thing. All right, so this stuff is going on in these places of land. Why do they actually get that land? Well, let's see. You said 47 years. I'll go back... Uh, Back 1947, well, let's go back a little further. Let's go back to 45, okay? Let's make it two. And see why the alien suddenly showed up dead and had to be shipped out. In 45, a bunch of folks got out here at Alamor Malamorgo, New Mexico, got out there, and they bombed them off a bomb. <laughs> and the atom bomb went up, boom, right out there. Nothing went boom out there it didn't bother anybody on Venus and Plato so you don't have to worry about it when they come down outer space to help you have peace on earth to stop them their atom bombs I'll tell you who did shake it shook somebody who was on the ground and somebody under the ground here heard their house go Boom! <laughs> and they said, what new doctrine is this? <laughs> now, <laughs> you got to keep your sense of humor, folks. You go crazy. Uh, have you ever flown over that mess? I have flown over this thing here. Is that the strip of land right there? And this one here, too. That one right there. I have flown over that and back from Los Angeles to San Diego and over that and back from Boise, Idaho and, and Seattle, Washington at least 46 times. And I'm telling you, when you fly that plane, the thought thoughts often occurred to me, some of the strangest thoughts I've ever had just been flying in planes. And I, when they look, I will look out the window, I think all kinds of things, you know, because you're getting up there where... You're, you're not where God sees it, but you're up there where the whole thing is under you down there, and of course the Lord way out beyond there sees better than that, and, and, and you get to keep thinking about the Lord and His omnipresence and His omniscience, and, and it boggles your mind. I, mean, I, I have never looked at a plane when looked down there going over Pittsburgh or going over Detroit or going over New York. I mean, I've been over a man. Nuremberg, Munich, Frankfurt, you know, Seoul, Honolulu, you name it. Manila, and looked down like that. And thought to myself, now how does God know what everybody's saying in those cars down there? 
every right of word that men shall speak, they must have some equipment that car made out of stone. That's recording all this stuff. Is there any stone or sheetrock and, and drywall and stuff? Has that got any stone in it? Has the foundation got any stone in it? Maybe it's picking up the whole thing, see? Or we'll just play it back and flip the switch and when she comes. I'm looking at it like this. All those cars going up down there. And I said, myself, how did God know what's going on in all those bedrooms down there? I mean, fly to L.A., you know. Seven million people. You can fly an airplane over L.A., you're going 200 miles an hour and it takes you 15 minutes to fly over the place. <laughs> Look down there, how does God know? He knows all that. How does he know all that? I thought to myself, he kept track of everything back in Pensacola I left and my family. You know, everything has happened over in the Philippines since I left there 40 years ago. And everybody, of course, everybody is saying in the Ukraine and Naples, Italy and Salerno and Madrid and Mexico at the same time. And that's why your mind just gets just screwed up and on what you're doing. Trying to keep that thing together. And I get thinking about the bigness of God and the, and the, 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 what they call the immensity of God. Thus saith the Lord, I fill heaven and earth. I get thinking about those things. I'm thinking about it right now. God fills this building. Where is he? I don't see him. But if you're looking right at me, I know it. You still see me. I know it. I'm still looking. Where am I? Looking? Where are you, Lord? Right? Job says, I can't find him. He goes, by me, I don't even see him. <laughs> Look over here. Where are you, Lord? Right there, right there, right there, right there, right there. Folks, if he fills heaven and earth, is there any place where he isn't? Well, then he's right here. But you don't, you can't see him. He hides himself. He's the hidden one. I got thinking about one day, I thought to myself, man, what is man? I'm a man. What is man? The more I got thinking about thinking myself, we're just a pile of ants. We're just nothing. I guess the most blank thing in this world is a person. It's just, just a nothing. We think we're so, this, we got an ego stuck in us someplace, and this ego keeps saying, me, 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 and there ain't nothing there. Just a pile of junk. I mean, I mean, suppose you were 30 feet high. What would you be in God's sight? Why nothing? You think the being that filled heaven and earth be impressed with a 300 foot man? Why, he'd be a shrimp. <laughs> we think we're big, you know, for seven feet, eight feet tall. Well, that's kid stuff. Giants in the earth in those days, 30 feet high? Well, what's that to God? Ain't nothing to God. I look out my window in the airplane one time, I thought to myself, now what if a giant showed up right now and stuck his face in the window? You know, think about that. You know, Jack and the Beanstalk, you know. I mean, I'm up there 31,000 feet, look out the window. Hey there! <laughs> you know, the guy looking in the window. <laughs> and this guy is 32,000 feet high. Well, if that sucker had a heart attack and fell down flat in Pensacola, nobody even feel the shock in New Orleans. 31,000 feet. It's only, you know, if you're only, only six miles high, hit the ground, they wouldn't know about it in New Orleans. And God fills heaven and earth. Boy, something. Get thinking about those things. Anyway, when I'm flying over this area, you know what I've always thought? I look out the left window. I look out the right window sometimes, coming and going. I look out there. You know what I see? I see this great big washed out, dirty, gray, brown, green rocks, uh, rattlesnakes, armadillos, cactus, bone dry, no rivers, no grass, no trees. Just like a plague went through there. It's right in the Sierra Nevada and the Rockies. And that thing runs for hundreds of miles. I've often thought of that. And that Grand Canyon, that rip. And the river comes down to what is called the Snake River. <laughs> Did you know there are more towns in Arizona with the word hell attached to them in the state in the Union? Hell this and hell that and hell the other thing in Arizona? It's right here. I've looked at that thing, I thought to myself, well, boy, when Noah's flood went down, the water began to wash off, he had sure did a job in there. And that thing goes down to Mexico. But down in there, once a bunch of poor folks and washed out country, and it's all right through there. It's a strip in there. All right, now, that piece of land there got something wrong with it. That had a bomb more boom like that, then this stuff started. And I'll give you the material I have. Now, you understand, uh, I don't know if I believe everything I'm going to say. 
And uh, I've got a book coming out about uh, January called Black is Beautiful. I decided to throw them a curve right at the end. And so I wrote two books. One is called Black is Beautiful and one is called God is Love. That'll flip them. That'll flip their lid. Anyway, Black is Beautiful is about black, co uh, black members. That's the most poisonous snake there is. And Black Power. And the Black Power Salute. And the Black Berets. And the Black SS Uniforms. And the Black Cadillacs. And the Black Helicopters. And the Black Death. And the Black Plague. And the Black Maria. That's a hearse. Black Maria. And the Black Cadillac, the, the mortuary full of drives. You know, with the hearse. And uh, Black Power and the Black Salute. And Black Mail. And the Black Ball. <laughs> and then Black Holes. And some other blacks. Black is beautiful. Oh, now here's one area up here. I'm going to show you another one here. Down where I live, in Florida, the Sunshine State, where it rains six inches a week, <laughs> we have uh, Cuba down here and Key West off down here like this. And then we have the Bahamas sitting out in here like this. And Puerto Rico and Haiti, a bunch of stuff in here like this. And Yucatan Peninsula down here like this. At least this is the last, this is where I remember last time I was up in a UFO. And then, uh, and South America sit down here like this. <laughs> and this down here is the Gulf of Mexico. And down here, uh, for a period of about, uh, 200 years, just every now and then somebody just vanishes out of sight. And they call this place the Bermuda Triangle. It's an area like this. But technically it's not a triangle. If you got the thing accurate, the thing is more like this. It's a shape like that. And extends over here, the Sargassa Sea and the Sea of Weeds and Reeds and stuff, and heads out toward Africa. And when a hurricane starts, it usually starts somewhere there. Now once in a while come in here, but the source is off over here. And they come in like this, and come in like this, and come in like this. They come from here. Here's Christopher Columbus. He sailed the ocean blue in 1492. <laughs> and on he comes. You know what he does? He goes right into the middle of the Bermuda Triangle. Right into it. When he hits San Salvador, which means Saint Savior, and he is sailing Santa Maria, Saint Mary. He goes right to the Bermuda Triangle. When he gets in there, is his, uh, his, one of his uh, his uh, first mate, uh, a fellow named Gonzalez, is keeping the ship's log. And the entry from the ship's log in 1492 on one of those nights says, Strange lights dancing up and down along the shore. Brilliant lights pass by the boat. And the next day when the sun clears, there ain't no island there. That's the first shot of even a triangle. That's 1492. All right, here's an area in here like this, and here's a Guantanamo air base down here. And when they send the, the Naval Air Boys up to Norfolk, the Naval Air Station, they put them around the triangle and send them up like that. They don't send them through it. And the newspapers, it's kind of like AIDS. Newspaper says, you can't get AIDS from sweats, you can't get it from mosquitoes, just from blood. No, you're lying. You know, I know you're lying because I've seen time after time them seconds in the ring when them boxers reach over Mop Moth, they got these little gloves in their hands. You worry about the sweat in that black boxer, are you kid? Why don't you live by faith and take them off? You know, we have down in Florida, we have a girl down there got AIDS from a dentist. He never even kissed her, held her hand. And he got it from her, from him. So when you get this stuff here, the paper never tells you the truth. They say, they put these things on. Could this be? Could this be? Speculation. Is it possible? There's a possible explanation. Millions of unsaw. Hey, man, the Navy don't take a chance with it. The Navy is tired of losing planes. They send them around it. Upper Norfolk from Guantanamo. I preached one time up at uh, Don Green's in, uh, 
in, in uh, what is he, Lansing? Lansing. And he got me the plane one morning. He says, uh, he's a real soft spoken, quiet talking fella. And he says, you know, Brother Ruckman, he said, I have a case in my church. He said, uh, a man won't talk to you while you was here. Didn't get to talk to you. He said, uh, he talked to me, but he said, folks wouldn't understand him, think he was crazy if he said what he said to me. I said, well, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, you couldn't shock me with a shocking machine, man. And so he said, well, he said, well, Brother Ruffin, he said, uh, he was uh, doing uh, some uh, diving for the Navy down in Guantanamo. And his job was to take pictures down the bottom of the water. And he said a couple of times he was down in here and he's making this stuff out in here. And he's diving around down there and photographing these steps down in the water. You know, you've seen pictures of them. And this remnant of so-called Atlantis that sank out there and all that kind of stuff. Hitler got all screwed up with that. And he's down there at the bottom of the water, fooling around that stuff like that. And he said, uh, he was down there and he heard people screaming. And he said he came back up and thought it was just a case of the bend. You know, the pressure working on him. He maybe went down too quick or got up too quick. And he said about a week later, he was down there again and heard the same thing. And he said, preacher, they scream like I'm being tortured. And he came up and he knew nobody would believe it, think he was crazy. So he resigned and got out of the Navy, 50, oh, something like five years before his retirement, and came back up to Michigan and forgot the whole scene, just got out of it. He couldn't stand it. I got to report that fellow, that uh, French fellow, Jacques Cousteau, he ran into the same thing. Not much was said about that. Now, I'm not saying I believe all that stuff, but in that strain, that concentration down there, that's a strange thing. They said a UFO comes out like this, and that's just how that hurricane comes out. It comes out just like that, spinning out of here. Now, there are two of those spots, and if you go home and get you a globe and take you a, 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 a big, long spike and run through that globe, you'll come on the other side of the globe about here. And here's Japan on the coast, Manchuria, Chosan, or Korea. And off down here is Okinawa, right here. And then the Philippine Island is sitting off down here. And right in here between Okinawa and the Philippines is a triangle. They call it the Devil's Triangle. That's where the typhoons come from. They come out of there. And the hurricanes come out of here. Isn't that a strange thing? Now there's something else even strange about this mess. <laughs> If you take the 30th parallel, it runs like that, run around the equator, and run that thing around there, that thing goes right through that place in the Philippines, and right through that triangle, and when it sails across to Egypt, it goes through Alexandria, Egypt, and the Sphinx, and then it goes right into the uh, Sinaitic Peninsula, and right across Sodom and Gomorrah, and the Dead Sea, and where Cor and Dathan and Abira went down alive into the pit. And then if you run that 30th parallel on a little bit further, it goes from the Gulf of Aqaba, a path in the Gulf of Aqaba, into the Persian Gulf, Kuwait, Desert Storm, and there's a great big old hole right there, and the three deepest places in that ocean are in the Persian Gulf, and the Devil's Triangle, and the Mariana Trench, the Mariana Trench, and then this thing over here in the, in the, in the Atlantic. Ain't that strange? Oh, I take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. You've got to quit here in a minute. Now you get enough today to choke you for a lifetime, brethren. And here in a couple hours, this stuff I'm dumping on you, I must confess it took me more than 40 years put together. So it, it may, tax your, may tax your mind <laughs> when you go back today, lie down and try to get some sleep. <laughs> Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose a smoke out of the pit, at the smoke of a great furnace, like a volcano coming up. And the sun and air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out the smoke locusts upon the earth. Those can't be real locusts. You kill locusts with smoke. That's how you kill them. You want to protect a bunch of grain field from locusts, you put up bonfires. But not this bunch. They're in the smoke. But these are the wildest looking locusts you ever saw. 
verse 7. They were shaped like horses. They had crowns like gold. And their faces were the face of men. And they had hair like women. You ever seen them things in Detroit? (laughs) Those are forerunners of something that's coming down from underground. They don't come down outer space. They're under your feet. Verse 9. Wings. Verse 10. Scorpions. Look at that stuff. Eight teeth like lions. They're monsters. Those are monstrosities. They're animal mutants. They're coming from downstairs. They don't come upstairs. They come from downstairs. The Bible said in the tribulation when that horseman showed up, the one that sat upon him was death, and hell followed him. Hell followed him. The earth opens. Something comes out of the pit and starts tearing across this earth. Now, isn't that something? You know why you're so fascinated by Star Wars and Star Trek, you know, and the Exterminator and the Terminator and the Rosemary's Baby, you know, and the horror on Blankety Blank Avenue and all that junk? Well, that stuff fascinates you because that stuff is real. It just hadn't happened yet. But boy, she's coming. Now, you know what they're adjusting you kids to? They're adjusting you to horror. And what they want to teach you is that anything that's abnormal or perverse is beautiful. That's what they want to teach you. So you get, uh, you know, or, you know, E.T., you know, Wormhead or whatever his name is, you know. The cute little maggot. <laughs> and then you get, uh, you get Charles Adams, you know, the Munster family. Where the, the vampire is funny, and the witch is funny, and Frankenstein is funny to help the little kitties. And that's why the little kitties like dinosaurs. Kids are fascinated with dinosaurs. So you get Jurassic Park, you know, and this stuff. And then when you really put it on, you give him King Kong, because he has a bride. Now, of course, in the movie, they don't get married, but she's saying, Oh, Kong, oh, Kong, you're getting shot. Oh, how I'm going to miss you. <laughs> Imagine a woman missing a six foot eight, but not a 40 foot eight. <laughs> don't you see what they're doing? Beauty and the beast. The woman loves this monster. Don't you see what they're doing? They're preparing you to accept distortion, perversion as normal. They've been doing it for a hundred years. 1900. Music. You don't, you don't, most of you don't like and listen to Mozart and Beethoven and Schumann and Handel and Vivaldi and Boccherini and the ones who can really play music. The rock music you listen to is perverted, distorted, ugly music. And you're taught it's pretty. You like it. Despots to fry an egg, man. You think that's pretty? Yeah, you do. You like it. You're conditioned. Your mind has been worked on. Now, you know how I know that? I don't have to be an artist. I always did appreciate beauty. I like beautiful things. I appreciate them. I know what beauty is. I know what's when it's not beautiful. I know the proportions are right. And any time you find somebody thinking that that a woman who looks like this is beautiful, Barbara Streisland, <laughs> you've got rocks for brains. <laughs> You know what they're doing? They're trying to make you think stuff as ugly as beautiful. You take Joe Namath, the glamour boy, and Ringo, the glamour boy. Those are two of the most beast, ugliest pusses you ever looked at in your life, man. Those faces would stop a clock and put a freight train off a railroad track. (laughs) But they condition you. So you kids, Saturday morning, turn on the TV, and what are you getting? You're getting monsters. 
But they're not all bad monsters. Some of them are good monsters. So it isn't just the, not all the iron, iron, metal, mechanical robots are bad ones. Some of them are good and help you out. The Iron Man. I read in uh, Daniel chapter 2 that the image has legs of iron. But when I got down to the feet, the feet were part iron, part clay, and had ten toes. And he said, when he talked about that thing, he said, these toes of iron and clay, he said, they'll mingle themselves, the iron, with the seed of men, the clay. But they won't mingle with one another, even as iron is not mingled with clay. Got a robot in there. And it's producing. Iron, mingled with clay, the, the clay is the seed of men. And the iron is something else. It's inorganic metal. And it's producing organic material. Alright, so they're getting you ready for ugliness now. The big thing is dinosaurs and monsters. And, and, and the monster is the kid's, the kid's buddy. The kid gets up at night and goes to the wind and has, you know, has a communication with this friendly little monster to come to help him out. Now all that stuff is getting you ready for something. And according to the material I have, most of this stuff is going around a place called Groom Lake. It's right there in Las Vegas. It's right there. So Las Vegas recently built two things. A great big pyramid and a sphinx sitting right beside it. How many of you knew that? Let me see your hands. Don't get much news, do you? A great big sphinx as in fox Fax, sex, hex, hoax, jinx. You remember when Ruckman told you about that 40 years ago? She comes right down to the X. X marks the spot right in here. And that place is called Groom Lake, and part of it is called Area 51. Now, if you remember those two things, you'll have the key. This area here is called Groom Lake. Ultra secret security, no longer called yellow security, but called black security. CIA. Black is beautiful. Groom Lake. And the area is called Area 51. And right by there is a fine old Japanese boy named uh, Hay Hayawaka, or Hawayaka, or Hayakawa. I can't remember how he spelled his name. H-A-W-A-Y-K, something like that. You know what he does? He makes videos and UFOs. And he'll show them to you. He'll show them to come out at night and flying, going around, going back down again. He's right over here with his camera and picking them up at night. And the military made a move and cut off the, the reservation. And before he got permission to photograph those things off the reservation, they caught him on the reservation. And he was making pictures of those things and a couple of big black Cadillacs sailing there without any license plates on them. Outstep the old SWAT jackbooted thugs, and that's what they are, with automatic weapons. Held him up, took his film, everything out of his car, told him to get out, or not to come back or they'd kill him. No identification, no driver's license. The, the fellows who stepped out and got him had no driver's license, no driver's plates, and no names. Anonymous. And after that, he had to stay off the reservation and photograph long distance with his camera. I got the videos at home. But that ain't the half of it. Underground here, they say, and when I say they, I'm talking about 40 to 100 eyewitnesses who've worked there. They say that at that area, they've had, they have stainless steel tunnels running on the grounds for miles and miles and miles, going down first, first level, second level, third level on down there. And down there, with the courtesy of the CIA, Roman Catholic organization founded by Wild Bill uh, Donovan in World War II with the OSS in Canada, with the courtesy of the CIA and the FBI, they have an arraignment with the aliens. And they haven't recovered all just dead bodies to autopsy, they've recovered as many as 27 live ones in the last 30 years. And about 40 dead ones. Whenever those things happen, there's a, just a news blackout. Black like that. Nobody moves, nobody dares move. 
the ones who've been down underground this area say that when they come in there, there's a system of computers and checks and lights and electronic stuff you wouldn't believe, and that when you leave the place, you pass through a thing that has electronic things that have to do with memory retention to get rid of certain parts of the memory. They say that when a fellow works there, he's told not to do speak about this under pain of something or other, and if he opens his mouth, the first thing you do is declare him to be medically sick, and then get him to a doctor and get him to the hospital and get him out of the way. Otherwise, he suddenly has a heart attack, or he commits suicide like Clinton's buddy, who wasn't even sick and wasn't talking about committing suicide, and they vanish. The senator from uh, Nevada's name is Lear. The Jet Lear is named after the senator from Nevada. Las Vegas is Nevada. You know what the senator from Nevada says? Who holds the world record, world record for jet flight? And has every award that an aviation man can get in the National agency, agency, uh, Aviation Agency? You know what he says? He ain't no color woman hanging up laundry while she sees a UFO in her backyard. He's a senator who holds a bunch of world records for jet flight. He said, if you ever see one of those UFOs coming around your house with those bright lights and pretty lights and sparkling sound, you better run like hell. That's what he said. Then we had another fella. And I forget his name right now, but I've got it at home. And you know what he did? He got investigating these things and he said, uh, resist. Resist now. To let the public know about it. And he said, when you get them, he said, hand them in the air, don't hand them underground, hand them in the air, cut off their water, so they can't operate without water. They hang around water reservoirs. They can't operate without electricity. Cut off electricity, cut off their water out in this area, you can get them. He said, no compromise, they don't make deals, if they're dangerous, they're vicious, he said, kill them. So they declared that fellow was nutty and gave him shock treatments. Another fellow wound up in Lewisburg prison, he was a German. Uh, named Riker. And Riker invented a machine that could stop a UFO propul propulsion system. And they put him in Lewisburg, and one of the prisoners killed him after he'd been there about six months. Now, brethren, when a man like Rush Limbaugh stands up and says, there's no conspiracy, and when a man like Slick Willie says, there's no conspiracy, you can just double over laughing and split your gut laughing. There's a conspiracy you wouldn't believe. Amen. Now, I'll close with this. <laughs> and we haven't got really good going yet, but we're about halfway around the track. Uh, this is what they say. When I say they, I mean four volumes, 500 pages of these eyewitnesses. They say this. They say that the CIA contacted this bunch after World War II and the Germans contacted them first which you might as well have guessed. <laughs> and they say that the <clears throat> Germans immediately got a contact with them at the South Pole. The reason why you get kept in the Antarctic because they've got things going down there where they've got something working with something that's in the center of the earth. The fellows who teach in Hollow Earth teach their two openings, the North Pole and the South Pole. I don't know about that, but I know there's something there and there's something there. And there might be some more. I read south the Dead Sea that Sodom and Gomorrah are reserved in everlasting fire in Jude. They must have dropped right down into it. That'd make it south of the dead, the dead, the dead sea. The dead sea is 13, 13, 13, 1300 feet below sea level. 13. And right below there is where Corn, Dathan, and Byron went down into the pit. So there are openings somewhere. Well, this fellow Riker, you know what he invented? He invented a machine that would uh, stop the propulsion system of UFOs, and they got him sold away and then got him assassinated. Now, I have testimony from a jet propulsion engineer with 18 years' work with jet propulsion systems who was taken in a black Cadillac with pool blinds to that area put into a shaft, the Cadillac went down the shaft, the doors opened, they stepped out into these black uniform guards standing around looking like zombies, just like you see it in James Bond. The whole thing is set up just like you see it in James Bond or one of these wild shows, set up just like that. And he said the, the, the security was oppressive. 
and they take this place here where he used to work on the UFO and put him in it. He works in that thing for eight hours. And that bird comes out. He can tell you about the black, the black box in the middle that runs the thing, and the metal in the black box that they haven't located what the metal is and assigned a certain title to it, and how long the UFO is, how high it is, how wide it is, and how the propulsion system works. Got the stuff that big in paper, single space, both sides. It is not rumor, they're there, but the trouble comes in with why, and they say <laughs> that the CIA and the American government has made a deal with the aliens, that the alien will show them how to bend light rays, Philadelphia experiment back in, during World War II, to make things invisible, and show them how to attain speeds above, you know, 5,000 miles an hour without burning up the metal, and show them these things, they'll let them do what they want to do, operate in the United States as long as it's undercover. And so every now and then you read about a bunch of oxen and cows being stripped of all their entrails and everything and no blood. And the blood gone. And somebody has performed an operation there you couldn't perform with a laser. And it's nearly always by a power line. Folks, I'm not pulling your leg. I've got guys in my school whose daddies own farms in North Alabama that have seen the things and picked up the cattle. Most of the cattle disappear from Wyoming and Colorado and Montana out in the West. And the ranchers are real upset. Nothing they can do. One of them got out there investigating what he found beside one of those mutilated cattle. A U.S. a U.S. Army scalpel, a doctor scalpel, with U.S. Army on it, just like you have U.S. Navy on the utensils. So the Pentagon ain't giving you the whole story. Now this is an agreement out here, and the guys who've been through it say this. Now, this is the shocker. When you go through here, these vats, and these vats are piece of human flesh, and other kinds of flesh. And here are glass tubes up against the wall with people in them, standing there. Some of them in terror, some of them unconscious, some of them in apathy, in these glass jars, eight, nine feet high. And then over here are a bunch of heads, like somebody needed to behead people. Revelation 20, verse 1 to 3. You didn't read it, did you? Revelation 20, 1 to 3. And about 10 years ago, a boxcar fell open in a very embarrassing place, one of these stations, and they had, they had a bunch of guillotines in there. Hey, no conspiracy, you know. <laughs> so they say this agreement is, let the aliens get what they need, and this is what they say. One class of aliens are called greys. One class of aliens are called reptilians. They have wings. One class of aliens are called Syrians. One class of aliens, you might have known it, are called Elohim. That's the word for gods. A gray looks like this. And the most common picture you'll see of a UFO will look like this, or an alien look like this. How many ever seen that picture before? Let me see your hands. That's a gray. Those things are about three to four feet high. The reports on those things and abduction by those things run into the hundreds. And every year in America, about 33,000 children disappear. About 33,000. And they don't find them either. They stay gone. And the material I have says that these things here prefer children's flesh to adult flesh because it hasn't degenerated as far. And some of the greys don't eat through their mouth. They absorb it through their skins. Now, the data I've got, I've got the digestive systems and the metabolism and the circulatory system and the reproduction system of all four of those described in detail in medical terms. 
And that ain't no James Bond story. That's a doctorate work. And the things are in there. And they've been working with them. And they're running little, little trundles up and down the hallways with the guard just like you see in the movies. You know what the people say who know the interior of this thing, you know what they say? They say that when you see a movie like Star Wars or Star Trek or the stuff comes from Hollywood, that stuff is inspired. And that stuff is produced by electromagnetic projection across an area. So the scriptwriters produce the movie and the scenery they want produced. And they prove it. Up in Connecticut, have a North New Jersey, they have a station up there. And you know what they did? They put out this electromagnetic stuff uh, beyond shortwave. You can't hear it on your radio or your TV, but it comes through it. And it said, uh, go to Flowerwood Park next weekend. Go to Flowerwood Park next weekend. Go to Flowerwood Park next weekend. And Flowerwood Park, the little park in some place in Connecticut, uh, I mean a thousand people, and it'd be a mob for a park that size. And nobody had been that park for ten years, the people walking through there occasionally. And the next weekend, they show up 2,000 people at Flowerwood Park. And somebody says, well, why'd you kind of stone? We just kind of thought we got it to go here this weekend. So they got a system set up where they got projecting towers, putting out this stuff. What they're after, bless your soul, is mind control. So when you lie in your bed at night or sit in a church service, you're having the thoughts they want you to have. And boy, when you get in there, you know what you're getting in that Bible? You're getting the prince of the power of the air and principalities and powers and the spiritual wickedness in high places. And you have to learn how to bring every thought into captivity and obedience to Christ. That's what you're getting into. While they got this thing going, these colleges are messing with this DNA stuff and fooling around all that stuff. They're trying to create this kind of stuff. They're trying to create mutants. Half man, half monster. That's what they're working on. Now, I've got to close it somewhere, so I better close it here and I'll say this. These things profess to come from outer space, from different constellations. And maybe they can make it in their ships. I don't know. Maybe they can. I don't know. But they can certainly prove they can move those ships at five and 10,000 miles an hour. They can prove that because they're flying them. Except now the CIA, except now the CIA is flying them. The army is flying them. It's more than just I mean, the, the, they've been working the technology for 30 years, so they got the thing going. And so when the rapture takes place, all this stuff surfaces. And when it surfaces, the public wants to know what happened to all these Christians. They can tell you. They can tell you one of two things. They were transported to colonize these other planets, or else we had to eliminate them because they wouldn't go along with the system that we're bringing in. And it'll hold water. Because they got the technology to prove it. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Had a guy phone me up about, must have been about five months ago, he's a Christian. His boy's a Christian, his daughter in law's a Christian, and his boys had five run in with UFO occupants messing around his bedroom at night in the backyard. And the first two or three times he was terrified and told people about it. By the time the whole town thought he was nuts, he just shut his mouth. And been going right on with it without telling anybody about it. Now he's married and his wife is scared to death. And I was telling him about what to do about it. And uh, he was a farmer, lived out in an isolated I said, you live in an isolated place, don't you? He said, yeah, they usually show up there, see. And I said, uh, have you got a dog? He said, yeah, I've got a dog. He said, you sleep in the house at night? I sell him in once in a while. I said, you ever had trouble with UFOs? He said, no, never have. So sometime I thought my boy was crazy, losing his mind. I said, your boy got a dog? He said, no. I said, get him one. He said, he and my wife, he and his wife now, my daughter-in-law, staying here in the house with me uh, for a while. I said, get him a good German shepherd and let him come in at night and lie down in the bedroom. And you'll find out real quick whether you've got the real thing or the, or the wrong thing. An old dog, a good one. And a German shepherd is a good one. He'll intimidate you even when he ain't biteable. <laughs> But that German shepherd, he'd lie in that place, something like that going outside. Those hawks will come up, boy, and you'll, and you'll start that stuff, and you know you've got something to deal with. 
Okay, I better stop here. I'm going to give you one more illustration up in <laughs> North Alabama. Uh, listen, brethren, in the last days, perilous times shall come. And whatever these things are, they're a combination of animal and superhuman. So if you want to run them down, you'd have to run them down to the sons of God in Genesis 6 that got shacken up with animals. And that's where your Greek mythology came from. Your centaur. And your satyr. Now that's tough. You say, oh, you're just pulling my leg. You better try reading Leviticus 19 to 20 before you think I'm pulling your leg. You better see beauty in the beast. In Leviticus 19 and 20. And learn why God wiped out that whole civilization. And the animals with it. Well, anyway, up north Alabama, here's what happened. Now, this is the Matrix. And the Matrix is written by an unsaved fellow. He's not saved. And he's trying to explain what takes place because he has, doesn't have the knowledge you have. So sometimes he makes mistakes. And the funniest mistake he ever made was describing what took place in North Alabama about 1960. And in 1960, a farmer heard a commotion out there at the back end of the house, heard his boy screaming, a 12-year-old boy, and he came out to the back of the house, and here were three or four graves hauling that boy off. And back there in the woods, by him, this big silver object back there, UFO. And that farmer, the, the writer of the, the writer of the article says, this farmer had kind of a, a closed mind, kind of a tight mind set. Which means he was a Christian. <laughs> and he said, uh, he didn't know it, but the greys have one failing. The greys think when anybody says anything, it's true if they don't know the fact behind it. So they accept the thing is so without checking it. That's what he attributed to what happened to that little failure in the part of the greys. But that ain't what happened. He said, the farmer stepped out there and said, you put that boy down right this minute or ask my God to blow your rocket ship to smithereens. And they dropped him and ran. Now that matrix writer said he had a peculiar mindset. Yes, he did. <laughs> and they said the gray has just accepted that as true without checking it. Don't you worry, it was true. And if that's the truth, when that fellow said that, there wasn't one month, there is no, there's nothing. There is no mon monster, there's no monstrosity, there's no monster, there's no principality, there's no power, there's no cherubim, there's no half animal, half beast in the universe that doesn't know that Jesus Christ is Jehovah God. They know it. They know it. And they're not going to show up because his people are gone. So you can fasten your seatbelt and get ready to fly. All right, brother, that'll be enough for this morning. I'll take home and chew on for a while.